I'd say the, the most important thing for us or the thing that felt like it really changed our trajectory was finding product market fit. Right. Um, and if you haven't invested in finding that product market fit, uh, kind of no matter what you do, it's not going to matter because there isn't a big market to buy what you're building. On today's show, I'm talking to Calvin French Owen, the CTO and co-founder of Segment, a Californian-based scale-up whose success has led them to be a 350-strong organization out on the West Coast, a growing business in Dublin with around 50 people, and starting up in a number of other locations. What's the secret of their success? Well, I caught up with him during Web Summit out in Lisbon to find out a little bit more. This is Tech Talks, your twice-weekly technology podcast with myself, David Savage, exploring the thoughts and ideas of leaders across the industry and bringing you a little bit of tech insight if you're just interested in the sector. Enjoy the show. So it's Monday morning and I'm recording Tuesday's show with Evie and Ali. Hello, guys. Now, Ali, you were talking about technology just a moment ago. I was. A dating app. Um, Not so much a dating app, a, I suppose. No, it's a drinking, drinking game. It's, it's a dating game. accompaniment. Yes, yes. yes. So uh, let's say you go on your first date, um, you download this game, it's a drinking game, just for two people. Yeah. And it, it helps you ask difficult questions. <laughs> By getting you drunk. Yeah, exactly, yes, exactly that. So, right, I love technology, <laughs> but something's gone deeply wrong. <laughs> First of all, why can't you just come up with drinking games without the need for an app? Welcome then, to 2020, David. What a lack of imagination. <laughs> or just get drunk and ask questions, perhaps. Yeah. Instead of, you have to drink. <laughs> when I played drinking games, all we needed was, you know, a matchbox. If we were really struggling. Matchbox? I'll ask you yeah. on the show what that is. Matchbox game? What do you do with a matchbox? You throw it in the air, and if it lands standing up, then you have to down the drink. If it lands on its side, it's two fingers. What? Did you make that up, that game? No, I think it's just a standard student drinking game. Is oh. it? Yeah. We play Ring of Fire. Oh, that's a good oh, one. No. Kings. But you need, a, you need a whole deck of cards. Ride the bus. Versus... That's a dangerous one. A whole oh, deck of cards, fine, but in a bar, not as easy as just a matchbox. True. Five's Alive as well? That, that oh, yeah, we can. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah 21, good. Fuzzy Dog. Yeah. Uh, Fuzzy Dog's good. Yeah. Uh, Thumb Master. Oh, is that the... Yeah. Okay. There we go. Part of Ring of Don't Fire. need an app. Well... Welcome to the new age. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the new age, like it's a bit tenuous, but I, I love the fact that today's guest, Calvin, um, started his company because he watched a film all about a company uh, that was kind of formed in the new age. Mm. First time I've ever met someone who said, yeah, the social social network, oh, yeah. that, that made me want to start a company. Love I it. thought that most people would watch that film and go, <laughs> no, <laughs> not yeah. these guys. Um, anyway, so yeah, we'll hand over to Calvin. He is CTO and co-founder of Segment. Uh, whilst it has some fairly interesting origins, the story gets a lot better. So stick with it. Uh, it's really interesting chat, joking aside. And then myself, Evie and Ali will have some comment and some news afterwards. So we're sat with Calvin here at Web Summit. How are you this morning? Doing great. Co- Thanks, David. Co-founder and CTO of Segment. Yep. Yes. And have you just arrived in Portugal or have you been here for a few days? I've been here for a few days now. Yeah. I arrived Saturday afternoon from a flight from Dubai, actually. All right. Okay. Why? Why Dubai? (laughs) Uh, So my co-founders and I were doing this trip to Tanzania. Okay. um, Just as kind of an annual trip and also as part of our 30th birthdays. Oh, nice. Um, So we ended up traveling there, going on safari for seven days. It was an incredible experience. Something that I recommend everyone just do at least once in their see, lifetime. Uh, is, is it the big six or the big five? The big five, big yeah, five. Yeah. yeah. Did you see all of them? Took we them all? saw all of them, yeah. yeah. Lions, hippos, rhinos. What, yeah, what, what, was, was, what animal impressed you the most in the flesh? I think, so, I'd say the animal that impressed me the most was the leopard. Um, yeah. We'd spent our entire first six days just searching for leopards. <laughs> um, and they're kind of elusive because they hang out up in trees um, they're this cat that's much smaller than lions. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they typically try and stay off the Serengeti so that they don't get eaten, get eaten or injured. or uh, A general concern. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we saw this one that was had just killed a wildebeest. Yeah. It was dragging the wildebeest up into the tree so it could protect it so that lions wouldn't get to it. And then after it dumped the wildebeest up in the branches, yeah. it started calling out to its pups. Um, but the pups were too small to climb the tree. So the leopard actually crawled down, went and picked up one of the pups, 
and then climb the tree with the pup like hanging out of its mouth. And it's amazing got that it. such brutal thing looking things can be so ja- anyway. Yeah, it was crazy. So you're at Web Summit. At no, Web Summit. Maybe not to talk about <laughs> Safari as much as, as as you might like. I don't know. But um, why are you here? What tell us tell us a bit about Segment and, and what you're doing at the summit. Yeah. Uh, so I just g- guess just to give some general background, uh, if you're not familiar with Segment. Segment helps companies gather data about their users. Yeah. If you're running a website or let's say a music app, you're probably running a website, a mobile app, maybe you have data on your servers or in mm. a database. Maybe it's also stored in a tool like Zendesk or Salesforce where customers are emailing you or you have various touch points. Segment helps get all that data from the places where it lives into one consistent place. So you just have a single view of the customer. Mm-hmm. And then we help send that data to all of the different tools your business might be using. Um, Because no matter what we found is that whether your business uses a CRM like Salesforce or an analytics tool like Google Analytics or um, perhaps a help desk like Zendesk or an email tool like MailChimp, they all just need the same data, which is who are my customers and what are they doing? Um, And so we really help companies provide that world-class level of service by powering their customer data infrastructure. Why is it that they don't do that themselves, built in from the beginning? <laughs> you know, a lot of people try to. Um, and I think that the true fact of the matter is that it's really hard to do well. Um, at this point, we've spent the last seven and a half years investing in infrastructure, which scales to uh, hundreds of thousands of requests per second. Mm-hmm. We're tracking 450 billion API calls every single month. Um, and really, it's hard to deliver that infrastructure at scale uh, and it's hard to build it right. Mm. And what we see a lot of companies end up doing is they, they kind of go down this path where they hack something together and it's not really anyone's main job. And maybe they have this data pipeline, which is connecting data from their website. And then there's some sort of half-baked uh, Kafka or Kinesis layer that's dropping data all the time and it's not well formatted. Mm. Sometimes there are tracking issues that happen where you just lose data for weeks or months at a time. Mm. Because it's no one's core focus and no one's core job, either companies end up not having good data, where it's spread across all these different silos and databases, and it's hard for them even to answer questions like, how much money am I making this month? Yep. Um, or they have to invest hundreds of millions of dollars and thousands or hundreds of thousands of hours of engineering time. Um, and really what you see the most successful companies doing, right, like the Facebooks, the Googles, the Amazons of the world, is they're the ones who are pouring massive investment into better understanding their customers yeah. so they can provide that better product and that better level of service. So how many how many staff is Segments today? So we just crossed a little over 500. Okay. Um, most of that's based in San Francisco, uh, where we have about 380 people, I'd say. Mm-hmm. And then we actually just uh, closed our 50th hire in Dublin, yeah. um, where we have an office as well, uh, which is kind of our main European presence. And then we also have a handful of offices in New York, Vancouver, yep. Sydney, and London. Now you mentioned that you've just come back from you and your kind of friends and co-founders' 30th mm-hmm. birthdays. Yeah. And your company's about seven and a half years old. So you founded this, what, 22, 23 years old? Effectively right out of school. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now you're, now you're at an age where most people might be kind of going into the type of role that you've held for all that time and built this business. Yeah. What do you think you've learned and what might have you done differently? I mean, obviously it's been successful, so you won't probably change too much, but there must be some stuff that you look back and go, God, I wish I'd known that. Oh man, yeah. If we had to do it all over again, I think we could have moved maybe 2x faster on everything that we'd done. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just an insane amount of lessons. Uh, and actually it goes back to our original founding story when we first started out. Uh, So myself and my co-founders, we all met during freshman year of college, Mm -hmm. uh, and we'd been roommates at MIT, and we just had this idea that, oh, we wanted to start a startup together. Um, Not for any good reason of wanting to, uh, like, create a product that didn't exist, or, like, because we had some sort of fine sense of business acumen. Yeah. We just wanted to build a company together because we thought it was cool. (laughs) And why not? Yeah. I think a lot of people probably... Sit around I, I with think their so. friends I think and say, so, you know? hey, wouldn't it be great to do X? Yeah, we'd watch The Social Network. We, yeah. were, just, we were just excited. <laughs> um, so at the time, being college students, yep. uh, kind of the advice that we'd always heard was build a product for your, that solves one of the problems you have. So we started building actually a completely different product, uh, this college lecture tool. And the idea was that, let's say you're sitting in the middle of a big college lecture hall. Uh, there's maybe four or 500 students. Sorry, just to jump in, because this is an interesting point then. Did you yeah. did you view it as a product or a product for a business? Did, 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 did the business 
factor really come into it initially or was it just let's try and build something that fixes a problem? We were trying to pitch it as more of a business, okay. which I think also was a problem for us. Right. Instead of just starting with a product that solved problems, we were trying to create a startup because we thought that's the way that you build companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, anyway, you were saying you were yeah. sat, you were sat in, in lecture halls. Yeah, so imagine you're sitting in the middle of a big lecture hall, 400, 500 kids, yeah. uh, and the professor is up at the front of the room and they say something that doesn't really make any sense. They write something on the board, maybe it's wrong, maybe there's some problem that they have with it. And you kind of look around and you're confused and you realize that everyone else in the class is confused too. But the pre professor doesn't realize they just keep going with their explanation. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to solve that problem by giving the professors just real-time feedback whenever the class got confused. So we gave students this little app where they could basically press a button and say, I'm confused, or I get it, and the professor would have a little iPad app saying, here's the real time, we call it a confusion meter of the class, uh, letting you know. I've lost half of them. Exactly. <laughs> I need to slow down and go over this. Exactly. Um, so we, we started building that and prototyping it. And yeah, yeah. we actually got into Y Combinator, the big startup accelerator over in the US uh, with that idea. Mm. And we built it out over the summer and tested it in classes at Stanford uh, and Berkeley and a bunch of the Bay Area classes. Uh, after, was, was it easy to get into those schools and uh, test? It wasn't so bad because um, I think there were kind of two parts to it. One was that the Bay Area was really open to experimentation. Uh, mm. and I think it still is. Uh, like when you see companies out today, they leave scooters on the streets or allow you to hail an app or a car from your phone yeah, yeah, or yeah. install some new app to do some whatever use case, deliver food, whatever it is. And people are just really open to that. Uh, people will do it because they think, oh, it feels good to be on the cutting edge and I'm excited to try out new pieces of tech. Yeah. Um, and then the flip side, I think these were mostly summer classes, so they didn't have the same level of prestige and kind of high stakes that when we transitioned to the fall we had. Uh, so it's mostly grad students teaching yeah, courses yeah, yeah. and they're just okay with whatever. So moving on a little bit, yeah. you said that Ireland is your European base. Mm -hmm. First of all, why Dublin? Why not London or why not Paris or Berlin or even Lisbon? You know, Lisbon's a huge, a huge tech market now. Yeah. So we originally started the Ireland office, I want to say two and a half years ago or yeah. so. Um, and when we were looking, uh, we were kind of looking at a combination of factors. Uh, definitely some of them were economic, uh, looking at the different tax implications. Uh, a lot of them actually centered around uh, the privacy regulations that were rolling out. Uh, obviously, Segment handles a bunch of customer data. Yeah, yeah. And so thinking about the privacy landscape is super important to us. Uh, and we wanted to be in a place which uh, had a good set of those sorts of regulations, um, was well aligned with the EU, uh, and generally we felt like would help us navigate those regulations yeah, yeah. and actually turn it into a fully fledged product that could help all of our customers become GDPR compliant. Uh, and so when we were looking at the different options, Ireland kind of stood out as this up and coming tech hub, uh, good part of the EU, uh, solid recruiting basis, you know, yeah, yeah. embedded in that privacy landscape. And so it, it felt like the right place for us to land. And was it difficult going from having a big presence in the Bay Area in the US to a, an entirely different cult, culture and country because Ireland is yeah it is quite unique in a lot of its you know the pace the working hours the expectations of the people that you're hiring they are going to be subtly different yeah it's interesting um as we as we spread and kind of sprouted different offices in these different geographies there are definitely pieces of the culture that differ where uh, the working hours are totally different or the pace is different or the people even just sort of like form their own community. Mm. Uh, but we do pretty frequent trips back to San Francisco and headquarters and back to New York as well. Uh, I think overall we've done a pretty good job of establishing our values in a way where the people at any segment office feel like they're a part of this whole. Um, I feel like the two things that do that are one, just going back to our mission everyone at the company is really driven to deliver value for customers mm -hmm. uh, and to make sure that all of our customers are successfully able to launch and build their products powered by the best customer data in the world. Yeah. Um, and so I think the, the fact that people feel like they're tied to that mission and that they have legitimate in impact on the business, like, like I said, 30% of our uh, business actually comes from outside the US, mm -hmm. um, really ties people back to that central mission of segments to deliver to tens of thousands of companies. So look, um, we mentioned about 
lessons and learnings. I think yeah. I think one thing that would be really interesting to finish on, from your experience, if you had to turn around to anyone who's now in a similar position to where you were seven, eight years ago, what one thing would you try and ask them to, to bear in mind? Mm. I'd say the, the most important thing for us or the thing that felt like it really changed our trajectory was finding product market fit. Right. Um, and we struggled for a year and a half. We built this education company. We built a bunch of failed analytics products. We went back to our uh, head advisor and he told us, wow, you wasted a quarter of a million dollars and you're still at square one. <laughs> um, and we tried all of these things to yeah. get back to eventually what we found out to just be a product market problem. Mm. Um, and if you haven't invested in finding that product market fit, uh, kind of no matter what you do, it's not going to matter because there isn't a big market to buy what you're building. Yeah. Um, and actually, there's there's this very good uh, survey that this company, Sur Superhuman, this email client, um, ran with a bunch of their users. and basically asked them to say, how disappointed would you be if Superhuman was no longer a product? Um, and if that number is above 40%, then you know you've hit some measure of product market fit. Yeah. You, you know you've hit the thing that people will buy. Uh, and so I think my advice for any startup out there is just assess yourself honestly. Do you have product market fit? And if not, do you think one extra feature will get you there or is it time for a bigger yeah. pivot? Well, look, I really appreciate your time because um, I know you're probably quite busy whilst you're here at Web Summit. Uh, uh -huh. You're speaking, aren't you, as well? Speaking on a couple of panels. Yeah, yeah. looking forward to it? I am, yeah. And the sun is shining, so once that's done, you can... <laughs> enjoy some kind of quite mild November weather. But I hope so. Have yeah. a safe trip home and thank you for your time. Cool. Thank you, David. How depressing is it that um, this multi-million pound company uh, or multi-million dollar company that's based in, in San Francisco is run by a bunch of 30-year-olds probably not as depressing to you two as it is to me. <laughs> I, I'm glad yeah. you started there, Dave. I'm glad you started there. <laughs> um, I, I just think that the, whole, the whole origins of this company is great. Um, you can just see these people are so driven and they just went with it. They just went with the flow and now they're 30. And they're in a great paid off. And they're paid off. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, Calvin's a lovely, lovely guy, but there is that thing of like, he fits that mold of the tech entrepreneur where yeah. it's worked. Uh, he's incredibly nice, incredibly what you would stereotype, imagine a lovely American to be. Um, and I love the fact that there is this kind of idea that, that him and his mates sat around at college and went, yeah, we want to run a company because social network looked cool. Um, let's all be Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, it's like know. you always talk about it and joke about it, but I feel like no one actually really does it. Exactly. How many but, times have you had the conversation with someone? Listen, oh. I think we should start a company. I've had a conversation with Evie. Yeah, so hundreds of times. Crazy. But what I absolutely adore about it is that during that conversation, I was kind of like... Kind of like, oh Christ, they're kind of saying everything that everyone else in the podcast has told us is the wrong way to go about it. You don't start building a company by building a company mm. or looking for a business. You build a company by finding a product, by finding a, a, a problem that you're passionate about, and that's how you build a company. But whilst they started by saying, we want to build a company, they quickly realized that unless they got the product market fit right, they yeah. were screwed. That was the wrong mm. way to go about it, yeah. I mean, and he admitted he was the first one to admit to that. Yeah, but oh, wasn't the right way to go. But hey, we're here now. It would have been two times faster if we did it that yeah. way. But that's what you learn, though. As yeah. Well. Um, how do you feel about the fact that they burnt through a quarter of a million dollars worth of, of funding before they realised they were back at square one? That's insane. I can't, <laughs> I can't imagine how he felt when they realised yeah. that that had happened. He must have been distraught. I like. I would. There's no getting that back, is there? Like, <laughs> that's a lot of money to to waste, essentially. But. But they got the product market fit as a consequence. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. They so put that extra nothing. pressure on them, pressure that they needed. I don't know whether, no, this, this is quite political, but I'm going to mention it anyway. Uh, well, when the, they were looking for, what, what are you making that face for? Oh, Dave, every time you say something like that, my heart starts beating. I'm like, oh no, he's going to have to take it out. Oh, freak me out. No, I'm not. Um, when they were looking for European headquarters, they went to Dublin. Oh, yeah. Because they needed to find somewhere aligned to the EU. Mm. Now, I think that London and the tech scene in London is fine for the next few years because the level of investment or the level of commitment from the investment community is so high, they're not going to suddenly pull out of the capital. Mm. But it's interesting to listen to a seven-year-old West Coast business who are growing and ambitious 
going to Dublin and hiring 50 people in Dublin over London. And yeah, they're opening in London now, but secondary. And Dublin is now the European hub because they wanted somewhere that had close alignments to the EU. Yeah, puts people off. Exactly. But but isn't Dublin is slowly becoming a huge tech hub? Didn't Google move their head office there? Dublin is a it is a big a, tech hub. Yeah. But it was that line of that alignment to the EU that worried me slightly. That that is the perception that that people coming into the European market well, will have. Well, think about it. You guys are you guys <clears throat> are leaving the EU. That's what. That's hey, what look, you're you're happen. almost one of us. Well, no, you I have this. So <laughs> <laughs> I have a European passport. So Dublin, here I come. No, that's a joke. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. But I do think, think if you think about it, I'm not going to put all my money and my faith into the UK if it comes to starting a company here that I want aligned with the EU. It's all right, we don't like foreigners, all right? <laughs> <laughs> that is a joke. Uh, um, <laughs> that part? <laughs> no, you're very welcome. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, it's, it's a worry, isn't it? That that is the attitude of a, of a, of a West Coast organisation. Yeah. Mm. Just, Surely. You feel like you're missing... You're, well, we'll be eventually missing out on stuff, whether you like it or not. Whether it's even not right. eventually. I think we we already are. Well, yeah, yeah. But Here's an example more. of one of that. Yeah, it's going to carry on going that way unless you guys stand up and say together we're going to not leave the EU. Mm. I well. think that's very important. <laughs> the end of this week might uh, <laughs> Friday's going to be so much fun. You were not coming in. <laughs> um, what about the fact that there's a bit of an argument there for them having or for an organisation having a chief data officer? Basically, you know, the, the reason that segment are doing so well is because of the fact that so many companies botch the handling of their data because they don't have yeah. one person looking after it. Yeah, they said it was like no one's actual job. They just like botched it, essentially. Which, given how important data is to companies, how mad is that? I know. That should be like one of the most important things to companies yeah. to get all their data handling. Yeah, right? you monetize it so easily. Yeah. Well, and well, isn't that what they do, though? Well, yeah. This is so... I mean, if any every company had a, a CDO, then they wouldn't have they a wouldn't business. Have a job, but yeah. that's not likely to happen. But it's it's nice that there that is that there's that reflection. Mm. Yeah. That 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 is what companies should be doing. They're not, so therefore they have a business. But it's worked out well for them. So it has. They get to go on safari on their thirtieth. Oh. Oh. Not safari, safari. A well, we call it a game drive. In South Africa, it's just like a... We call it a game drive. A game safari drive in South sounds, Africa. Safari sounds more fun, I think. No, I, I agree. Safari sounds, sounds more touristy. That's safari. <laughs> <fun. laughs> That's why it's fun. Sounds I, like what rich people do. I don't think Calvin and the team minded one bit, whether it was called safari yeah. or whatever yeah, you call it. Definitely. Anyway, we'll go to our advert break, and when we come back, we'll have a bit of tech news. Once a month, Tech Talks opens The Tuck Shop, a YouTube tech news roundup, which is kindly carried by Disruptive Live. Disruptive Live is the UK's first and only 24-7 TV channel for the technology industry. Stay up to date with all the latest industry news by following our regular talk shows broadcast live across the Disruptive Live website and social media channels. You can also catch Disruptive Live at some of the largest global technology events, broadcasting from London, Manchester, Singapore, Dubai, and many more. Welcome back to Tech Talks. Bit of technology news or technology uh, environment ecosystem news um, before the working week gets well away. I suppose it's Tuesday by the time people are listening. It's Monday. We're recording it on Monday. <laughs> Easing our way into the into the week. Uh, London leads the global co-working revolution. I believe it. Well, co-working we know is like huge in London. It's everywhere. Yeah. But apparently London and New York in particular, I didn't realise this, are way out ahead. So London is in the midst of a co-working boom with new data revealing that the UK capital has seen more new co-working space openings than any other city in the world this wow. year. Wow. I like that. I do. However, I go into a lot of them and I do wonder what their kind of USP is against. You know, you've obviously got WeWork. Mm-hmm. I increasingly hear a lot of people say negative things about WeWork. Do you? Yes. All I hear is they've got like ping pong tables and beer. People say <laughs> mm, they feel a bit stale, they feel a little bit oh, really? structured. You know, it's very much the WeWork there culture. Are, there are a lot of them now, I go. It's quite cu- it's cutty cu- cooker. Yeah. Cut, cookie cookie cutter. cutter. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm, uh, and obviously they've had their troubles recently with regards to funding. Yes. Um, but yes. The article points out that there are a number of, of other co-working spaces in London. It lists a few that are noteworthy. The Wing, Fitzrovia. The Wing is where I recorded yes, yes, the interview yes. uh, with Balpro, Amber Costa, okay. just a few weeks ago. The Albright, which is London's first women's only members club. Oh. How do you feel about that? Oh, 
I think it's good and bad. Mm. I think it's good because it'll probably help a lot of women feel more comfortable mm-hmm. doing their work. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it's also still kind of pushing a, a demographic aside. Exactly. But I think it is also important to have areas like that which are like fully safe spaces as well. Fair play. Interesting. Mm. So we've also got... Such a diplomatic answer. Very, very well negotiated. We've also got Fora, we've got Clean Pros, we've got the Ministry, which you've been to. Oh, yes, I have. That's cool. So the Ministry, Southwark-based co-working space. The Ministry attracts London's brightest music professionals across its four floors of the office space, not just music professionals. That's really cool, Um, there is even a tequila bar in the ladies' bathrooms. (gasps) In the bathroom? Apparently so. What? What? Yeah. That's incredible. I mean, who's using the tequila I bar? Mean, it's very popular. Is that, that, is that after there's a long wee? Like, what? Is it even healthy? I mean, oh. Tequila is very healthy for you. They do say you should have one shot of tequila a day. Who, when that. you say they do say, who, who is they? I'm not one. Well, Medical <laughs> professionals. I read it once, yeah. <laughs> right, okay. Um, if there's a tequila bar in the ladies' bathroom, do they also need to dispense pineapple juice? Pineapple juice. Oh yeah, it's pineapple juice after tequila. No, that. Oh, I think um, it's just for shots. It's lemon. No, 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 no. Pineapple juice. Try it. Have a shot of tequila. Have a shot of pineapple juice. I can't bite. drink tequila. I can't oh, do fair, it. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, <laughs> mentions Google Campus, Uncommon, Makerversity, Huckle Tree, and the Food Exchange in Battersea. What it does di- demonstrate is there is a huge diversity of different environments that you can try. Um, you know, some of them are huge. So Google Campus offers a, a range of workspaces for 22,000 members. Wow. 22,000. Oh that shows how healthy the startup environment is in the capital. Yeah. But I do wonder, you know, there's, that's a huge amount of space. And often you go into these co-working spaces and how many people do you actually see in there? Mm. To be fair, when I've been to some WeWorks, they do look fairly empty. Yeah. And they're the big ones. I think I think basically there's this boom going on right now, but I'd be interested to see where we're at in five years' time. I like the fact that there's more diversity, but I also wonder what they each have to offer. Like mm. tequila shots in ladies' bathrooms, nice novelty feature, but actually is that going to sustain them going forward? Yeah, yeah that's true. And what purpose is that serving as well? It's just like, a gimmick, like, isn't it? Give us like, massage, you should be don't give us tequila in the bathroom. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? If you're listening the ministry, we know a few people there. There you go, massage chairs, not tequila. Makes more sense. It does, to be fair. Anyway, I think that will probably do for today's show. We will leave it there. Uh, We will be back with you on Friday when we will be crying into our cornflakes. (laughs) 